We're gonna keep the preamble short this time as I've already made quite a lot of content about this adventure. The basic bullet points for the set. This is the most recent booster set by WizKids. It tops out at large sized minis. There are 47 minis in all. It includes repaints of the minis from the Undead Army Zombie set. And this is a pretty great set for beginners since it includes a lot of classic creatures. If you entered our giveaway during the brick unboxing a couple of weeks ago, stay tuned to the end of this video for the announcement of the winner. Today I am reviewing a factory set of minis kindly sent to us by WizKids. They're the same ones you'll be getting, but they're just packaged all in one box for me. I'll be showing you comparisons between the minis in this set and the Undead Army Zombie set, plus the limited edition box set that we had uh, a couple weeks ago that had an alternate paint scheme for a couple of the minis. So stay tuned here over the next couple of weeks for my review of the Fendelver and Below Legendary Edition from Beetle and Grimm's, the Hydra Premium figure that went along with this set, and the next D&D book, The Book of Many Things, which is gonna be quite a video. I promise you that. Right, let's get to it. Here are the minis for Fendelver and Below the Shattered Obelisk. You ever just want to pull out your phone and be playing RPGs like Pathfinder with your friends? Tabletop Town brings that asynchronous play to your fingertips in a beautiful streamlined package with all the bells and whistles. Play great indie RPGs like Honey Heist, Moonlight on Rose Hill Beach, or big games like Pathfinder 2nd Edition with the newly released remastered rules. Character sheets, dice, the official rules, images, and chat are baked right in. You can even specify with a tap if you are chatting in or out of character. The app is free to use with optional purchases of official rules systems. Stop worrying about scheduling your next session and just play by post anytime you want. Download a Tabletop Town from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store today. We'll have the links in the corner or down below. So what makes troglodytes interesting and different from other sadistic underdark monsters who want to eat people? Not much, really. They sometimes scavenge weapons from others, and they are smart enough to make use of them, and they sometimes throw on some found armor. They even fight amongst themselves for some choice loot instead of doing the time-honored tradition of having a roll-off for it. You can find troglodytes in Out of the Abyss, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Tyranny of Dragons, and Tales from the Yawning Portal. When illithid egg sacs become corrupted due to Far Realm influence, they can become Encephalon Clusters, which then give birth to these little guys, Encephalon Gimules. It'll grow into a cluster itself if it's left to its own devices. It's a CR3 creature with magic resistance that can attach to foes to leech off their life force. This is a tiny creature upsized here to a small mini, a theme which we'll see throughout this set. This adventure is designed to be the first or second campaign a person runs in D&D. So the assumption is that they probably don't have a large mini collection either. So this set covers a lot of the basics, including zombies. Minis 3, 4, and 5 here are all designed to be basic zombies. And if they look familiar, that's because they are the same sculpts as the minis in the Undead Army Zombies pack, which we reviewed in the eye in the corner of the screen up there. As we go through these, I'll show you what they look like next to those in that Zombies pack. They are at least repaints of those minis, and unlike some repaints, which only have very subtle differences, these all look quite different from each other. The first three commons here are all human zombies, but we have some more interesting ones coming up. While I'd prefer to get original sculpts, of course I can accept these. Zombies are enemies that you'll want to attack in packs due to their low CR value. Plus, we all know that zombies are scarier in larger numbers. So if we're going to get dupes, at least we have some with different colored shirts on. Also helps us game masters when we're tracking which mini has which number of hit points. Speaking of basic minis, we get a little collection of goblins in this adventure. Now, many of the goblins that show up in this particular adventure are psionically enhanced, but we'll get to those later. We're starting off here with a basic goblin, another creature you can't have too many minis for. And as far as I can tell, this is a unique sculpt. There is a goblin warband set if you want more. You can see our review of that one up there in the corner. These oversized mosquitoes are also really common foes at low levels, and we haven't had many Sturge minis over the years, so this little creepy fella is quite welcome. It's another tiny creature, upscale to small. Like mosquitoes, they feed on the blood of the living and are pretty harmless in isolation, but if you get a lot of them at once, they can be pretty deadly, so it is good that this one is a common. 
And here is our first psionically empowered goblin. You get two stat blocks in the book, the Commander and the Brawler. And this is definitely the former, as you can see him here, wielding the Psychic Blade. It not only does a decent chunk of psychic damage, but it also causes a hit foe to subtract a d4 from their next attack roll or saving throw. They have some spell casting and some other abilities that we will talk about a little bit later. Lots of creatures in this adventure get warped by those Far Realm influences, including the villagers of Phandalin, and here is our mini to represent them. They all use a modified version of the Berserker stat block from the basic rules. This is another good choice for a common because you want several of these if you can get your hands on them. Ashen Whites are formed when a humanoid consumed by cruelty and rage dies in an area suffused with Far Realm corruption. And when they form near crystal veins infused with the corruption, they can develop psionic abilities, and they're actually entirely different beings than they were in life, and not necessarily evil. Some dedicate themselves to figuring out their old identity, and some seek out others of their kind. Our third a tiny creature in this set is the Flame Skull, laughing, crazed, disembodied skulls created from the remains of dead casters. They only have the tiniest recollection of their previous lives, but they do have quite a repertoire of spells at their command, including Fireball. They're bound to their creators and are usually employed to defend precious treasures or locations. Grimlocks are another classic D&D race. They were humans who ventured too deep into the Underdark a long time ago and devolved. They venerated the Mind Flayers during their occupation of the world, but over their time in the Underdark, they lost the ability to see, and they developed a powerful sense of smell. They have blind sight now, and their skin tone allows them to hide amongst the stone corridors of the Underdark. Next up is a basic wolf mini, a great addition for random encounters or beast shapes for your druid or as an animal companion. Wolves are quite popular as ranger pets as they have pack tactics, meaning that they get advantage when an ally is within five feet, and they might trip up foes on each successful attack. There are quite a few different wolf stat blocks across the D&D book, so you can usually find one to suit your needs, and now you have a mini for it. Neznar the Spider holds a very special place in my heart, and probably does in the hearts of lots of dungeon masters out there who entered the hobby around the same time I did. He was one of the first true boss level villains that I ever ran in the original starter set. He's a drow mage, and with spells like web and darkness and fairy fire and invisibility, mage armor, magic missile, and suggestion, he was the most complex character I had run up to that point. So I am glad to finally have a mini of him. Speaking of Drow, this set gives you quite a little Drow Warband, including Nesnar. This set contains six unique Drow minis, and honestly, this one, simply called Drow, might be the best. For your players wanting a dashing male Drow swashbuckler, here's the mini for you. You can do your own take on the classic Drizzt stereotype. And if you're looking for a female Drow PC mini, they've got you covered with this great Assassin mini, though I don't quite know what's happening with her hair there. As far as the actual adventure goes, there isn't a big Drow presence, though you will meet a Drow family of adventurers in the latter half of the story, but I doubt you're going to struggle to find a use for these minis. This was probably my biggest surprise in the set. Not that we got a Helmed Horror mini, because again, classic monster. Helmed Horrors are intelligent, magical constructs created to protect and defend, and they're smart enough to fight with tactics. They're not quite intelligent enough to fortify defenses. They're also able to fly. But what surprised me about this one, as you probably figured out by now, is that this is a Dwarven Helmed Horror, when all the ones we've had up to now have been shaped like humans. This is a great idea for a mini. In Chapter 5 of the adventure, the PCs will wander into a crystal cavern where they'll encounter a trio of Gricks. Despite their appearance, these are not special Gricks or far-realmed tainted Gricks. Like all Gricks, I use that word a lot, they've evolved to blend into their surroundings. And in these caverns, those surroundings are crystals. Hence, we have a crystal Grick. And it looks pretty amazing. Here's our next zombie, and it has the title of Most Recurring Mini. This elf zombie was, like all the zombies in this set, featured in the Undead Army Zombie set. But she also showed up in the Undead Army Skeleton set without her flesh. But she started off as a very much alive elf sorcerer in the Wizards Premium D&D line. So here's your perfect opportunity to have a character show up multiple times in your adventure in progressively more dire states, which seems like a lot of fun. But don't use this recolored version for that purpose, use that original zombie. 
Our next zombie had a bit of a skin color swap to go along with his re-dyed clothes. What was once a dwarf zombie has become a Duragar zombie, which is a fine way to reuse a sculpt if they're gonna do that. And in a pinch, you can have this fellow be a regular Duragar who just had a really bad day. Here you can see it next to the original from the Undead Army set. And next up we have the Halfling Zombie. If you're gonna try to use this one as a regular Halfling, then you'll have had to have a really bad day. No, I think this is pretty much only gonna pass the sniff test as a legit zombie once it hits your table. I am curious to hear what you think of them reusing these sculpts in this set. I was a little bit surprised to read the comments of our brick unboxing video because it seemed like most everyone was pretty on board with the idea. The more zombie minis, the better, I guess. This is one of the more powerful small enemies that you're gonna face in D&D. This is a CR8 Intellect Snare. These little scavengers form from the shreds of thoughts that rip at the minds of people exposed to the horrors of the Far Realm. You'll find them feasting at the remains left over after a Mind Flayer attack. They'll wrap up a creature in one tentacle while siphoning away their thoughts. Our other psionically empowered goblin stat block is represented here with the Goblin Psy Brawler. These little guys use their psionic abilities to augment their physical strength. Their regular strikes will do extra psychic damage and they might just throw you off your feet with an unexpected telekinetic shove, which they do as a bonus action. Here's our other Goblin Psy Commander showing off their other notable ability after the psionic sword. As a reaction, when it or one of its nearby allies is struck by an attack, it can summon up a psionic shield, which will bump up the target's AC by three, perhaps blocking the incoming attack, which is very much like a shield spell. A cool little Goblin Mini here with a very unique effect. I remember trying to hunt down a Nothic Mini when I was running this adventure back in 2017 and being completely out of luck. Well, it is finally here. When a wizard becomes obsessed with uncovering arcane secrets, they can sometimes be reduced to these tormented, monstrous creatures due to a curse left behind by Vecna, a lich who on some worlds has become a god of secrets. They covet magical items and knowledge, and they are also willing to share them for a price. This was the clear winner when I asked you which mini you like the best from our brick unboxing, and I have to agree, the Slotty are the mortal enemies of the Modron, the chaos to the Modron's order. A blue slot can inflict a disease known as Chaos Phage with their bone protrusions. Victims will be transformed into Red Slotty, unless they were powerful spellcasters in life, in which case they'll be warped into Green Slotty instead. Giant spiders are a staple in low-level TTRPG adventures, so I am sure you're gonna find a use for this one. They can maneuver easily on webs, they can restrain foes, they can poison them with a bite, which also paralyzes, but they're only level one creatures. So often these are the first scary monsters that an adventuring party is gonna face. It is literally the second encounter in the Pathfinder beginner box. We didn't really talk about what Gricks are. They are underdark predators and ambushers who hide amongst the rocks and wait for passing prey. They lash on with their tentacles and then bite down while also striking out with their tails. The Grick Alpha is quite a hardy version of a Grick with a CR of seven and a reach of 10 feet. With a climbing speed, they're probably gonna be waiting on that cavern ceiling above you. Mutate is a name given to creatures that have mutated due to proximity to far realm energies. Here we have a cloaker who has merged with its last meal to form this horrendous aberration. It can create four illusory copies of itself and swipe at foes with the corpse hanging out of its mouth to poison foes. It can also frighten foes with psychically powered moans. Moving back to regular Underdark monsters, we have a classic hook horror. These vulture beetle hybrids travel in packs and communicate by striking their hooks against their own exoskeletons or the stone surfaces around them, giving you, as a storyteller, a nice way to signal that something awful is about to happen. They are also relatively intelligent, with an intelligence of six, which makes them smarter than ogres and hill giants. Ceramorphosis is the process by which mind flayers, or illithids, implant their tadpoles into the brains of humanoids to reproduce. Apparently, they've also attempted this process on giants, with less than successful results. Ettons with two brains are another story. Two tadpoles are implanted. One of the heads becomes dominant and controls the cognition and psionic power, and the other one shrivels up into the body to control movement. They serve Mind Flayer colonies often as protectors. Another classic monster, ochre jellies, are unintelligent oozes that feed on living beings. As oozes, they can squeeze into impossibly small places. While not trainable, they're often deployed into passages to keep out unwanted intruders like pest control salesmen. 
Ochre jellies don't engulf, but do split into multiple jellies if hit with lightning or slashing damage. You could also use this one as a fire elemental. And here is the Encephalon Cluster from which those Gomules earlier spawn. This was another mini that got some rave reviews during our brick unboxing from a couple of weeks ago. Now the cluster here isn't just a dormant egg sack. It also has the intelligence of an ogre and can slam against creatures, potentially knocking them down. It can also spawn Gimules mid-fight. Our next mutate is the trusty old trash-eating Odiug with its translucent ghostly skin and its, supposedly, jet black plating over its limbs. Mechanically, it's not all that different from a regular old Odiug. It's generally more powerful with a CR of 6, up from 5, and it has immunity to poison, and it has this poisonous aura around it that can cause 1d6 of poison damage. But otherwise, it's just a cool-looking monster. Today's video is brought to you by Hit Point Press. The deck of many animated 5e reference cards can bring even more magic to your games, and they make fantastic gifts. Get animated spell cards, condition cards, or townsfolk NPCs. You can even get in-game items like the deck of illusions and the deck of many things. Get your deck of many animated cards using the info icon in the corner or in the doohickey down below. Back to Drow here for a little bit, starting with the Drow Priestess, who has a stat block in the Monster Manual. As you may know, the Drow are a matriarchal society with noble houses. Certain noble female Drow become priestesses of Loth, the Spider Queen. They're quite capable spellcasters with cleric spells like Mass Cure Wounds and Insect Plague. They're also able to summon a Yokelul demon once per day. Those noble drow houses are led by extremely powerful matron mothers who are the real drivers of drow society. They must maintain the Spider Queen's favor in order to retain their power. The matron mothers got updated CR 20 stat blocks in Monsters of the Multiverse and can cast some pretty powerful cleric spells like Suggestion, Gate, and Banishment. They can summon both a Yoklo and a Gabrezu demon to fight beside them. They also wield a magic item called a Tentacle Rod. Our final drow of this line is the Dashing Shadow Blade, also another solid PC mini choice. And I'll show you all the drow here in the set together in just a little bit. These are your drow elite soldiers, defending colonies, going on missions, assassinating rivals, spying on other houses. You get the gist. Monsters of the Multiverse gives you a demon summoning variant as well. Once per day, they can attempt to summon a shadow demon. And we finally get to our little collection of Mind Flayers. If you want more Mind Flayer minis, then this is the set for you, though they are all rares, unfortunately. We start off with Hashutu, the first of three Mind Flayer fanatic big bads from this adventure. Each one uses the CR 11 Mind Flayer Clairvoyant stat block with one alteration each. Hashutu here traded in his hands for tentacles, which effectively gives him blind sight out to 60 feet. Taking a brief Mind Flayer break here to look at our Gibbering Mouther mini, pretty much required for a Far Realm adventure. While it's a good mini for a good monster, I'm just a little bit disappointed that it took a rare slot. It's just a CR2 creature, so I think you could certainly have encounters with more than one of these. And I think I would be a little disappointed if this were my rare pull from a brick, but what do you think? Next up is a generic unnamed Mind Flayer, caught in the middle of lunch, or a performance of Hamlet, perhaps. Definitely an eye-catching mini, and one worthy of a rare slot. Honestly, can you imagine how well a Mind Flayer warband would sell for, especially after the success of Baldur's Gate 3? I'd be all over that. Until then, at least we have this set. Our second Mind Flayer fanatic Big Bad is Volsh, who was granted wings by Ilvash, the Mind Flayer godlet from the Far Realm. She's paranoid and prefers to stay up in the air with the help of her floating disc that she fashioned to keep an eye on any potential threats. She's immune to the prone condition and has a 30-foot move speed. Our last big bad mind flayer is Chisenix, a powerful psychic and true clairvoyant. She carries around a severed head that looks just like her own. This head is the source of her powers. It reads her thoughts, ensures that she stays loyal to Ilvash, and demands a lot of treats. That is directly from the source book. Finally, we have an unnamed Mind Flayer Clairvoyant, a Mind Flayer who has left the Far Realm and the control of an Elder Brain. Instead, they listen to the mad whispers of the Far Realm. In addition to all the fun stuff that a normal Mind Flayer can do, they can open portals to the Far Realm from which tentacles will erupt. The tentacles deal cold and psychic damage and can stun. 
This is the other rare mini that I'm not sure about. Ropers are, of course, classic D&D creatures. They hide amongst the rocks in a cave and then lash out at intruders with their tentacles. This Roper mini is fine, though I'm not sure it would be my choice for a rare slot, as again, with a CR of five, it's not necessarily the strongest of creatures in a one-on party fight, except for low-level encounters, I guess. On the other hand, we have one of the true gems of the set, the young Amethyst Dragon here, which represents the character of Lorenizel from the adventure. He and his companion, the mage Gosa, were dropped into the Far Realm at some point in the past and now find themselves trapped there. Perhaps you can help them out. Every adventure needs a Beholder representative, and apparently this one named the Oculorb is the one we're going to get this time. When the Far Realm starts to influence a Beholder, they can dream these into existence. They also fire beams of energy from their eyes, but this time they're powered by negative emotions. This mini feels like it has a lot of potential, but it also feels unfinished in this paint job. Out of all the minis in this set, it really deserved a better paint job, but maybe we can touch it up. In our capstone position, we have the biggest and, to me, the most impressive mini in the set, the Shambling Mound. Another classic creature that you can use in pretty much any adventure, here in the form that should scare the bejesus out of your players. Shambling Mounds are created when lightning or fey magic animates a swamp plant. It becomes an insatiable eating machine, consuming any organic matter that it can get its vines on. Well, let's start off here by looking at the little war bands that come in this set. Here, you're just seeing one of each sculpt, but if you get a case, remember that you'll be getting multiples of the commons and uncommons. So if you need a lot of psionic goblins, mind flayers, zombies, or drow, then this is a good set to invest in. It's also going to be my recommendation now for anyone looking to get started in the hobby. While I was a little bit disappointed in the second half of the adventure, aside from the final chapter, which was a lot of fun, I do think this adventure is the best jumping on point we currently have for players looking to get into 5e, especially those coming from Baldur's Gate 3. It's a straightforward adventure that won't overly tax a new dungeon master, and it includes all the classic bits that people playing D&D for the first time are going to want to encounter. And the mini set is pretty fantastic for new collectors. You get lots of very usable classic creatures, plus lots of iconic D&D monsters like the Roper and the Helmed Horror and the Sturge and the Giant Spider, plus of course Mind Flayers. And you get that awesome Amethyst Dragon, which I think is going to be a favorite for a lot of folks. The only thing the set really lacks are PC minis outside of the Drow, but honestly, I usually want more monsters and fewer PC minis anyway in sets like this. Let players go to the store and pick out the perfect mini for themselves or make one. We don't need a bunch of elf rangers that we're not going to be able to get to the table when we buy our booster sets. So yeah, those can grab some bricks of this set, maybe some warband packs as needed, or even classic creature sets, and they'll be set for a lot of encounters. It's certainly a lot easier getting the minis you need now than it was when I got into the hobby just six or seven years ago. Before we wrap up, let's compare the minis from the preview box on the right here to the final minis in the booster set on the left. As you can see, the paint scheme differences were pretty subtle, especially with the Gimul and the Odiug. The set did include an exclusive figure in the Flesh Meld, which is basically a more impressive looking gibbering mouther. You can see my review of that set by clicking the info link in the corner. I do wish they'd really go for it if they're gonna do paint scheme variants. The Fendover Envelope Booster Set is releasing this month, I believe, January 2024. A booster set of four minis is retailing for about $17. A brick of eight booster boxes is going for about $120. And a full case of 32 booster boxes is about $475. Do shop around to find the best prices and let me know what you think about the set in the comment section down below. You can help me make more content by checking out our sponsors using our links in the video description, the pinned comment, or in the info icon up there. Tabletop Town is free to try out, play your favorite games anytime, anywhere. Check it out in the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. And get yourself some animated spell cards, condition cards, townsfolk, and more to enhance your 5e games at Hit Point Press. And the winner of the free booster box of Fendover and Below Minis is... Captain Galaxy. Congratulations, Captain. If you'll drop me an email at contact at gallantgoblin.com, I'll let you know how to claim your prize. And you can join me and my friends and some special guests from the TTRPG creator world as we play the social deduction game Blood on the Clock Tower live each Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern here on YouTube and over on Twitch. And finally, if you're in the market for some lovable, huggable scamps, get yourself some customizable cobalt plushies by visiting heroplush.com. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end here. If you did, leave me a comment down below demanding to know why there weren't any penguin minis in this set. 
Let's see if we can confuse everybody else. For now, stay safe, have fun, love each other, happy new year, and I will see you next time at the Gallant Goblin.